So welcome everybody to the Florida, Georgia. We should, we should be playing the Florida, Georgia line music or something with us <laughs> maybe. Um, but to the user group meeting, this is our first virtual meeting um, and we wanna welcome everyone to it. So thank you for joining. This uh, is a combined user group meeting um, given the circumstances. We were hopeful that we would have some face-to-face -face ones this fall, but that didn't turn out, so here we are. So thank you for joining, and we think we got a great day or morning planned for you. Um, today we're going to be hearing from uh, Tampa Bay Water from Jennifer. She's going to talk a little bit about their journey to mobility, um, as well as uh, uh, we're going to hear from uh, Anna O'Brien. She's going to talk from IBM, talking about uh, uh, some hardware and for your mobility solutions as you move forward. Uh, then there's going to be a, kind of a general discussion on mobility trends from um, Amy Tatum and Russ Anderson. Um, and then Cobb County is going to present their mobility experience. So we think we got a good day planned. We hope you stay with us uh, for the rest of the day. Um, this is the agenda and, and the timelines uh, that we have outlined, and then uh, we're going to do some roundtable discussions at the end uh, of the session from uh, 11.30 to 11.50. So with that, Pam, I'm handing it over to you. All right. Thanks so much, Karen, and thank you everyone again for joining our virtual conference today on mobility. I just want to run through a few logistics before we start our first presentation. First, want to highlight that this is your conference and we encourage you to ask questions. Because it is a virtual conference, there's two ways that we recommend you do this. First, use a chat at any time to ask your questions. If you have a, a question specific to a presenter, you may want to put their name first so they can quickly see the question. So for example, if you wanted to ask Jennifer a question on the version of Maximo she's using, just put the question in the chat, something like that, and she can quickly respond. Secondly, as Karen mentioned, we do have a roundtable discussion at the end of the conference. We're going to bring back all five presenters, and this is your time to come off mute, ask them any mobile question that you may have, and we expect a great interaction and dialogue then. I'd also like to take a minute and thank our two sponsors of the conference today, Starboard Consulting and Cohesive Solutions. Both Starboard and Cohesive are very active in the Maximo user community and both recently sponsored the MUG conference that was held back in November. Also, both Starboard and Cohesive are very focused on our communities communities that especially need our help this year. With this in mind, we wanted to do something a little different for our conference. At the end of the conference, we're gonna draw randomly two winners. And for each of those winners, we're gonna donate $100 to their charity of choice. The only requirements for this is we ask that these winners are clients and we ask that they please stay in the conference the entire time. So a huge thank you to Starboard and Cohesive for their sponsorship and also for everyone attending today. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna turn it over to our first presenter, Jennifer from Tampa Bay Water. Thank you, Jennifer. So we're just gonna wait a minute. Yeah, there she goes. Yeah, I'm just working on getting it unmuted and sharing my screen. All right, can everyone see my screen now? Yes, great, thanks Jennifer. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> so I wanna talk about Tampa Bay Water's journey to mobility. And I am Jennifer Lawrence Jones, uh, Maintenance Planning and Reliability Manager at Tampa Bay Water. So first I wanted to talk briefly, who is Tampa Bay Water? So we are a regional water supplier for the Tampa Bay region. As you can see, we're about in the central Florida area on the West Coast. We support the uh, counties of Pasco, Hillsborough, and Pinellas counties, and also the cities of Newport, Ritchie, Tampa, and St. Petersburg. We are a wholesale water supplier, so we don't supply directly to customers. We just supply to the counties and the cities, and then they supply to the customers. 
here's a um, overview of our system. We have large pipelines that are transversing the three counties, and we also have multiple supply sources. So that's very uh, unique for a regional system is we can supply water from groundwater, which is the typical pumping of groundwater. We also have a surface water facility that we um, pull water. And then we have a desalination plant that sits down in the bay. So overall, we have three sources of supply, like I just mentioned, plus we have a huge reservoir that we fill up um, during the rainy season. You guys know it rains a lot in Florida during the summer. So we're able to fill up our reservoir. We have 174 wells across 15 different well fields across the three counties. 11 treatment facilities, eight pumping stations, five booster pumping stations, over 240 miles of large diameter pipe, and our pipe goes up to 84 inches in diameter. So that is huge. You can drive a car through that. Um, we deliver to 21 delivery points at the member governments that I just mentioned, monitor 17 water quality parameters, and have a daily flow that varies between 140 and 260 million gallons per day. Hmm. So we deliver a lot of water. So how does Tampa Bay Water use Maximo? Or what was our journey to get to Maximo? We started in 2014, we implemented 7.5 Maximo. And our original mobility idea was that our technicians in the field, our mechanics would use their laptops and connect in. Um, we upgraded to 7.6 in 2015. Then in 2018, we implemented Spatial 7.6 and tried using a mobility solution that was ArcGIS Collector. We'll talk a bit more about that in a second. Then in 2020, we upgraded to 761. And then throughout 2019 and 2020, we've been researching other uh, mobility products and we'll talk through that journey. <clears throat> so here's our originally built up, excuse me, original mobility concept in 2014. All of our mechanics had uh, Panasonic Toughbooks for being out in the field. And we thought they could connect in. We had a remote connection process and that they would connect in through the remote access process. But we found issues with that as they got out into the field. They had some of our areas, these remote well fields, they have areas of non-connectivity. There were some long lag times connecting and entering and syncing the data with the remote access. Um, it would just spin and spin and spin and they would get frustrated with it. And we also have mechanics that are not technically computer savvy with Maximo and um, the huge number of fields that Maximo has for them to fill out work orders, which is kind of overwhelming for them. So then our second mobility concept we tried to implement was using an ArcGIS collector um, app. And then from that, we built a form that was on the left-hand side that they could fill in information about the work order. and. We tried to sync all of the fields on the work order that we needed to have filled out by the technicians through JSON mapping capabilities in Spatial 7.6. Um, our technicians didn't really like the look and feel of this, that it was all a vertical kind of scroll on the left-hand side of the screen, um, that they had to scroll up and down and there were all these little fields. It didn't look, you know, the look and feel they didn't really like. Um, there were also some issues with the go live with our JSON mapping setups where there were some data type mismatches and missing domain values that hadn't been set up. So we were trying to work through those issues. Um, one of the biggest issues with the data that we couldn't get was failure coding. Um, you guys know how Maximo does the problem cause remedy and you put in a problem and then it filters down. Certain number of causes go with that problem. Certain remedies go with that cause. The ArcGIS collector couldn't do that filter down like Maximo did. Um, and then the last thing is there were some critical IT personnel on both our implementer side and our internal house side that knew GIS and knew collector and knew spatial that left about go live and right after go live of the product, which um, put us in a situation where we couldn't troubleshoot the final issues that we were having with this product. And then since our technicians didn't like the look and feel, we just abandoned um, this project. <clears throat> so our Maximo Steering Committee met and we set our critical success factors for mobility products. Um, we started working on that in 2019. So we said we need to have it perform basic work order management. Um, what we need to collect is time, logs, attachments, value reporting, starting and stopping of workflow, and they'd like to be able to see the work order on a GIS map. It needed to be really easy to use for our non-tech savvy mechanic personnel in the field so that they wouldn't be frustrated with it. It needed to have that good performance response. We saw with our first, our first solution that there was just a time lag that frustrated the mechanics even more. 
um, we needed to be able to have that offline functionality. So recognizing that we had remote areas that we couldn't um, have good connectivity in, it needed to be able to go offline, come back on and have a very simple and robust sync process. We wanted the screen view to automatically configure to devices being used. We had seen another issue with um, the Maximo screen is a certain size. And when it comes up on laptops, sometimes they had to scroll left and right to be able to see all the fields. And that was very frustrating scrolling left and right and up and down. So we wanted the screen to automatically sync and configure to whatever device they were using. Um, we wanted mobility app to adopt the user security settings in Maximo. We didn't wanna to have to set up a whole different set of security settings in the mobility app versus what we had in Maximo and try and make sure we kept all that in sync. And we needed to support a variety of devices. We have iOS, Android, window across phones, tablets, laptops. We kind of have a whole, like everything is out there amongst our workforce. And then working with IT, we wanted to make sure that there was no extensive configuration or maintenance time necessary or setup time necessary in getting this product up and going and making those little changes that you need as you work with a product and realize that you can do something just a little bit better. So what did we do on our search for a mobility solution? Through 2019 and 2020, we attended conferences, talked to vendors, customers. We searched the internet for mobility providers. Then we scheduled in-house presentations and demos from a few of the um, consultants out there and people who provide the products for mobility. We had IBM Maximo Anywhere come in and talk to us. We had Flute come give us a demonstration. Um, we also heard, talked to Data Splice and Easy Max Mobile. And of those four that we looked at, we decided to proceed with a free trial with our highest ranked product, which was Easy Max Mobile. But our biggest obstacle to implementing any mobility solution was how do we connect securely? So we have our servers on the inside of our secure network, and then we had the variety of devices that were outside our secure network that our IT department didn't want connecting inside because they couldn't make sure that all of those devices were secure and didn't bring any viruses in. So our solution, we realized that we needed to go with some kind of VPN tunnel. And we are currently, um, we just finished a trial with NetMotion and we're currently in a trial with Zscaler. And we will probably proceed with one of those companies for our VPN tunnel to work with the product EasyMax. Um, but we haven't decided exactly which one we're gonna go with yet. So let me talk about EasyMax Mobile. We have decided to go with EasyMax Mobile. And what I wanna do here is I wanted to give a demo but because of the limited time and issues that you could have logging in and trying to get a demo working, I went ahead and just did a screenshot of like every single step. So logging in and finding a work order. So this is our login screen. You would enter your login information, click login. The start center comes up. This is um, exactly the same start center you would have in Maximo. So all of the queries that you've set up in Maximo, all of the different um, start centers you have access to, they all appear automatically within EasyMax. And then so I'm going to click on the query here that says my work orders. It says I have nine of them available. And then it will list all of them. You could also open in the map. Um, I didn't do that for this presentation, but you could open in the map and see the pins where they all are in the map. I'm going to go ahead and click on this work order. And that'll bring me to the basic work order information. So <clears throat> on the left hand side, you will see different actions and things you can do with the work order. And on the right hand side, you see the basic information about the work order. So you can see this is a test work order I put in. It's in status assigned. We have a location and asset number assigned to it. Um, as I scroll down the screen, we have added pictures to our core Maximo for every single asset that we have. And then we display them onto a work order. And we wanted to make sure that functionality came over into EasyMax. So we were able to configure that um, fairly easily when we were setting up the trial. And so we got our pictures of our assets to come on over into the EasyMax mobile product. And then you get other basic information about the work order, um, work type priority. If it were a PM, you would see these fields here filled in with PM job plan and route. And then um, who reported the work order, scroll a little bit further down, you get your scheduling information, responsibility section and address. So that's kind of the basic work order that you see um, every single work order you go in will have that basic screen. And then, like I said, you have your actions on the left-hand side. So entering labor hours is the first thing we want our technicians to be able to do. So here is the labor area. Um, this particular work order already had two 
labor entries entered. So you can enter, you know, as many technicians as work on the work order can enter their labor. And they were both entered by me. But when you go into the screen, you would hit the plus sign over here. That's what you use for entering um, anything. Most of the navigation is across this top area. So I would hit the arrow to go back out to the main work order. But if I hit the plus sign, it takes me into a labor transaction screen. Now again, this um, how we have these hours set up is something that we configure inside of um, our Maximo. Not every Maximo has this. Is we separate our hours by time, uh, by type. So we allow people to have work hours, travel hours, your prep hours, getting ready and collecting your parts and doing whatever you need to do to get ready to go do your work. Your admin hours is used when we have things like training um, and meetings that the techs have to attend. And then the OJT hours is on the job training. So if somebody were training with somebody, we wouldn't want to count those hours um, towards, like if we were doing an evaluation of the planned hours versus the total hours done on the work order, we eliminate those OJT hours from that evaluation. So I would just go in here and enter the hour times that I have. So I've entered two work hours and one travel hours, and then I just hit the save button. And it'll give me a nice little message at the top telling me my record's been saved. So I know I'm good to go on and hit the arrow to go back out. And now I see I have three entries instead of two. I can go back out again and I'm back at the main work order screen. So then the next thing that we want our technicians to do is enter a work log and tell us what they've done, what they found when they were out there in the field. So again, down here on the right-hand side, you see work log. There's one already entered. We're gonna enter a second one. There's one entered, again, the plus sign. And you get a blank screen for your work log. Um, you have your log entry date, your log event date. So if I don't want this particular date that I'm entering it to be when the event happened, I could say maybe it happened yesterday. Um, enter my description and the details, and then I would hit the save button. Again, it tells you that the record's been saved, it communicates with you, it's very easy um, to use here. You hit the little arrows to go back out, you see now there's two entries, um, and you're back out at the main work order screen. Now another thing we do is we ask all of our technicians when they're finished with a work order to tell us what was the asset condition when you left that work order, and then what were the failure codes for whatever happened that you um, found out about. So we configured this little area here on the right-hand side to get that asset information and failure codes. So we have a condition rating as left. So again, we'd hit, now this little arrow on this one that's down on a field is gonna bring up a domain list. So when I click in there, I get my domain list. Um, we have a one to five rating on our assets as to what kind of condition they're in when they leave. So let's say this one was in good condition. It'll put a two in there. This failure class comes in from our asset that we've picked on our work order. So we go into the problem section, click that arrow, pick our problem, let's say unbalanced amp readings, and then we click our cause, and it was some kind of loose connection. And we click our remedy, and we tightened up that loose connection. And so we've got everything entered here. There's a remark section that we can type in and then pick our failed date. Again, using the calendar symbol, it'll bring up a little calendar and then you can actually pick the date. Again, hit the save button, brings you back out to the main work order. Oh, and then the next thing we do is um, we ask them to enter the cost areas they have. This is a little unique to our situation because we don't do our costing and our POs and our inventory issues and everything through Maximo. We have another system called Munis that we work with for all of that. And so our costs are entered there. So what we ask them to do, so if you go in here, we created this cost area, is just tell us by a little toggle switch where they got their parts from. So they can get them from the warehouse, from a store. Um, they use P cards, those transactions come in through a different area. So we have um, integrations that bring all these costs in and we just wanna make sure they've all come in by the time we close out the work order. So they just click the little toggle and it toggles over and they hit the save button on wherever they got parts from. They can do one or more. Um, they get their parts. Again, tells us record saved and we go back out to the main work order. Um, then the next thing they need to do, so they're done with everything they need to do with the work order. You see, that was pretty simple and easy to flow through. Um, they just go through the four things they need to enter. At the top of this right hand side, you see start workflow or left hand side, sorry you see start workflow. So you just click start workflow, tells you workflow is started. Now that it's started, they have to route it to their manager. So you click the route workflow. These are the options they get. They can say, I'm done with this work order, we're complete. 
They can say, I want to keep this work order in progress or send it back to their manager or say, I wasn't able to finish it. I need to put it back into waiting assignment. Maybe I'm going on vacation, whatever. Um, they can click the three different options. You see by this circle, this top one is highlighted and it's highlighted by default. So, cause that's what they're going to do 99% of the time. So they come to the screen and then just click okay. And they can go back out from the main work order. And then again, you can see all your work orders there. And I want to note here, so I had nine assigned to me at the beginning and now there's only eight because I went ahead and completed one. It disappeared off of my work orders. So this makes it very easy for them to find their work orders, get them done, clear their lists out and uh, move on with their day. So one of the things we said we had to have was offline mode. So to get to offline mode, you use these three little um, menu bar things at the top. First thing you need to make sure you do is sync with the server before you go offline. So there's a sync with server button. It asks you, are you sure you want to do this? It's been this long since you've done it. Say yes. So it's going to start syncing data. This takes about maybe 30 seconds or so to run through. When it's all done, it's done all this stuff. It tells you how many records it's synced and you just click the done button at the end to finish. And then you tell it to go offline. Now, before I go offline, I want you to notice it has like the blue and grays and it's all colored. When I go offline, everything turns gray. So it visually tells you, if you look at the screen pretty quickly, that you know I'm in online mode or offline mode if you're used to looking at those colors. Um, you have some queries or some links to the app set up here, and you can also set up more queries on the offline mode. If you go into work order tracking and then go into my assigned work orders for execution, you can pick a work order to go in. And again, you see a very similar screen with very similar um, setup, things on the left-hand side, the information on the right-hand side, I can scroll down, it's all there. And then from here, I don't wanna go through all of that again, but it's pretty much the same from here as being in online mode. But due to time, I'm gonna go ahead and stop. Um, the only thing that we haven't, can't do in offline mode is start and stop workflow. So we're gonna have to train our techs that they need to start workflow on all their work orders once they sync back up with the system. So our next steps, um, we have already purchased EasyMax Mobile. We are finalizing our screen modifications to the online and offline modes. We need to order some more iPads and Android tablets for our technicians, and then train our mechanics and technicians on how to use the EasyMax Mobile product. And then we're ready to start completing all of our work orders in EasyMax Mobile. So are there any questions? I think I have, what, two, three minutes left? And I can't see the chat window. Once I started presenting my screen, I can't see the chat window anymore. There, there was one question, Jennifer. Mm -hmm. uh, what was your year of acquisition for Easy Mac? Um, 2020. We just purchased that this month. Or it might have been last month, the end of, it was either the end of November or the beginning of December. We just purchased Easy Max. And another, do you have plans to implement maps in this mobile solution? Yes, we are going to implement the maps in this mobile solution. And Alex, I've, we've got a couple of folks that are trying to type into the chat, but they aren't able to. Is there anything that they need to do to enable uh, chat capability or that we need to release for them? Actually, mine just flipped back where I can see the chat and mine says chat disabled at the bottom where I can't. Oh, there it goes. It just flipped. So now everyone should be able to type in the chat. It, it should be open. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's open um, now. Go ahead and type it in. We might have time at the end if you weren't able to get your question in. I, can um, I can't really talk about the cost of EasyMax. You'd have to talk to them. Um, being a, a government, we have a government. Um, how, how does that work? I, I didn't do the procurement. IT did. But I know there's a company they work with that has pre-negotiated government rates and they worked with them on the, the purchasing of the product. I wasn't involved with that, that was IT. Um, so so it's, it's just about 1030. So why don't we move over and let Anna uh, get ready to start. But um, again, please feel free to continue asking Jennifer questions in the chat. Jennifer, that was an excellent presentation. We can't thank you enough. Thank you, awesome. You're welcome. Um, and again, remember, Jennifer will be back at our roundtable discussion in just about an hour to answer any additional questions. Okay. Thank you, Jennifer, and we'll turn it over to Anna.
Hi, good good morning and thank you everybody for joining us today and thank you Starboard for uh, inviting me to participate. I just wanted to see, are you guys seeing the, part of the presentation mode or my presenter mode? Uh, it's not full presenter. Yeah. Excuse me? That looks like the presenter mode. It's the yeah. two screens. Okay, so let me switch which screen. You look up there, there's like two arrows. There you go. To the left. To the left. There. Ah, oh, thank you. <laughs> there we go. Awesome. All thanks. right. No problem. So, um, thank you again for your time today. Um, we have a, a relationship with Samsung um, in that it, it's kind of, it's a co-marketing uh, type relationship. We don't sell the Samsung products and they don't sell Maximo, uh, but we have found that there's a lot of uh, symbiotic relationship that uh, we can uh, take advantage of. Um, one of the things we've talked with customers about is deciding what software to use is just part of the battle. Um, it's, you know, what am I going to use from a hardware perspective? Then there's connectivity questions. So um, there's just a lot more to it. And as you can see, um, mobility, field workers, frontline workers, there's a lot of uh, need in this field. So one of the things I found very interesting is that over three quarters of business leaders are like, yeah, we need to get mobility out to our, our end users. But if you look at the demographics of the Maximo user, uh, only about 25% of our users have mobility access. So this is a huge opportunity um, for our business partners um, and our mobility competition uh, to go out there and actually help our users um, provide better, more accurate, um, more relevant information into the Maximo system. As you've heard from Maximo for several years, it's all about moving to predict and we have IoT. So it's always interesting when we talk to customers who have lots of sensors and they've started to put IoT devices on older equipment, but their guys are still going out with that pen and paper. So some of the things that we were talking with the customers about, and it, there was some this consumer device tra um, some challenges. So you, 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 Jennifer was talking about iPads. Well, an iPad is a little pricey and it is nowhere near field ready. So from that perspective, you know, you have breakage, then you have to buy the otter box to put it in. Um, the battery is not fixed, so please don't leave it in your, your vehicle on a hot floor today. Um, you know, there's some you know, explosive issues there. So there's some other challenges to consumer devices, um, but then there's the commercial devices. They're meant for, you know, battle ready. <laughs> and that's really not quite what water utility needs or an electric utility or just generally Maximo customers. We do have DOD, um, but that represents a fairly small percentage of our customers. Um, the high price, you know, like I talked about uh, with general consumer devices. Um, and then there's still those legacy devices that are out there. Um, I remember all these from our cyclo days. Um, and but there's still people using these as you can see they've been updated they have different interfaces um, but there's a lot of challenge to bringing those uh, legacy experience into our current customer or into the current field worker space um, and then on top of that we're adding functionality you know we need to be able to take notes and sometimes that means handwritten notes uh, i noticed in jennifer's she has a general field where they can go and type in notes uh, so they need to be able to collect that information. And now in this new world we're living in where everybody's a germaphobe for, for very good reasons, uh, we need to worry about device sharing. Um, we need to meet health policies. We need to be able to sanitize the devices uh, when we are sharing them. Uh, so that the, the changes have really been uh, affecting what our customers need from a device perspective. So starting in 2017, we started working with Samsung. Um, they had released the second version of their Tab Active, and uh, it's a field-ready device. Um, it's an eight and a half inch tablet um, size to fit in a workman pant pocket, that thigh pocket. Um, since then, they've come out with the Tab Active Pro, which gives you that much bigger interface or bigger um, 
UI experience. Um, but then they started seeing that we have customers that really wanted a phone experience. In fact, um, uh, an amusement park, one of the amusement parks in Florida actually really wanted a phone type experience. They wanted that smaller form factor. Um, so since then, just really, just in 2020, have released the X Cover Field Pro, which is the phone size phone um, that is available from a business perspective. Um, and then there's the X Cover Pro. Again, you have the people that want the standard size phone, and then you want the the almost phablet type phones. Um, so we now have the Galaxy uh, Galaxy X Cover Pro. Now all of these devices are business. Uh, business to business devices. So you buy these through hardware providers. You can't go to Best Buy or Target and pick one of these up, or at least you shouldn't be able to. Um, you might be able to find one on eBay, um, but generally these are available through other business organizations. Um, just to kind of give you some ideas as to what's available with these, um, they do have the little S Pen, although they're not, it, it doesn't picture them over here. So the S Pen, this is a uh, non charging, so it doesn't require charging um, pen that works with the tablets. So this allows them to take written notes and convert those to text, uh, allows them to collect digital signatures. Now it's important to know with the digital signature, it does actually capture um, speed and pressure. Because um, when you're capturing a digital signature, it's not just the final artwork of the signature. There's actually a recording of how the signature was written, which can be used to validate the the authenticity of that signature. Um, so that's one of the things that's, that's for a regulated uh, area important to understand. Um, these are all IP68 uh, qualified, which means uh, they're ready for dust and rain and the real world of field work. Um, there's image notation, so um, those pictures that you're storing within your Maximo uh, database, you want to actually be able to make notations. Um, when you're doing condition assessments, you can you know, take a picture, for, further annot um, annotate that image so that you can collect um, more detailed information uh, using that picture as a thousand words methodology. Um, you can also use the pen to annotate maps. So once you've got your maps loaded in, uh, you can take advantage of that as well. Um, like I talked about the germaphobe. So in this past year, uh, Samsung has actually gone in and checked the sanitiz sanitization um, capabilities of the product. Because I don't know if you've been in the grocery store, it says don't spray the, the credit card pad. Um, and I know I was one of the guilty people in the beginning that would spray my little sanitizer spray on the, the tap pad um, before I would put in my pin code. Well, now they've gone in and they've looked at various uh, sanitation uh, type um, solutions uh, so that you understand what is available uh, and what the products will support uh, in order to allow you to uh, sanitize the device. And as you can see, they actually have dipping capabilities. So you can actually fully immerse. Um, I wouldn't soak. <laughs> they do say dip, um, but allows you to actually do that to keep those devices clean and ready for that next shift. Because again, this is about finance. I mean, we're going in, we're spending a lot of money on software. We're spending a lot of money to implement. And the last thing you want is, a, you know, another lot of money. Um, so, you know, you do need to be able to share your devices across multiple shifts. Um, so you want to make sure that they're ready to go. Now, off the shelf, these are not zone one or zone two ready, um, but with Ecom, they do have a partnership that would allow you to get these devices ready for your oil and gas platform um, or for any high volatile area. Um, <clears throat> these these are, of course, you know, exponentially increase the value or the cost of the tablet. Um, but when you're taking it out into those areas, it, it's almost an expectation to have that high cost. Um, and then for, like I said, for those people who are military, we um, uh, Samsung has several business partners uh, that they are working with to do that, one of which is Juggernaut, um, so that you can fully encapsulate this. You can make this ready to get run over by a tank. Um, so yeah, you can start off with that lower price point and add a, um, they also have quite a few um, 
um, business partners for cradles, for for um, barcode scanners. Although the camera itself does have um, barcode scan capability, you may want a pen or the little gun thing that you want to attach to it. Um, but also, um, this introduces us to some DEX, DEX cap um, compatible accessories. Now, DEX is something that is new into the ruggedized line. Some people may have already ha have had experience with it with some of the consumer devices. But what DEX does, it allows you to actually make your tablet or your phone your in-office experience as well. So you don't need a phone, a tablet, and a desktop or a laptop. You can actually use your tablet as your laptop. So through DEX, it allows you to, and this is Samsung software. Um, IBM has nothing to do with it. <laughs> but um, this actually allows you to plug your tablet in or your phone and change your experience to a more laptop desktop experience. So for those workers who only occasionally need to use a computer um, or a desktop or a laptop, they can actually use the tablet that they've been in the field with all day, come in, dock it, and then have a full keyboard if they really need to put in a lot of notes or if they need to access some other applications that require even a uh, larger form factor. This gives them the ability to do that. Um, you know, so you can bring in um, more information and you know, just gives you greater capabilities to do email, those types of things. Um, so it's, it's just something that we haven't talked about in the past, um, but with the 2019, 2020 releases of their ruggedized line, this has become available. We've shown this off at the UKI mug, mug group um, last November. Pam, you were there <laughs> back when we could travel. <laughs> Um, and it was actually very well received. Um, so it's definitely something to look into. Um, this also talks about NOx security. Uh, the Samsung devices actually have a very in-depth built-in security platform um, that you can take advantage of as well. Now I've talked a lot about um, you know, how prices compare. This is an idea of what your Tab Active 2 is. So the Tab Active 2 with just Wi-Fi in the U.S. retails for 419 list and 519 with Wi-Fi LTE capabilities with either AT&T or Verizon. So comparative to other tablets of that size, uh, the eight and a half inch size, this is considerably lower and this comes field ready. So this is ready for the three meter drop. It has the stylus that doesn't require excuse me, doesn't require charging, and it's ready to go hang out in the rain uh, while you're doing an inspection. So um, from, from that perspective, it, it's very right priced. Then from a distribution perspective, you get this through either Ingram or Tech Data or Synex or, or your, look for your distribution. So if you're working with one of our implementation partners like Starboard or Cohesive, they have relationships with distribution arms who can look to uh, getting these devices for you. Again, this isn't something that you go and you pick up at Target or, or Amazon. <laughs> so, um, you know, that, that is an option. Now, Samsung has been extremely generous at providing free samples for any of your uh, proof of concepts. So Jennifer, this is coming a little late for you, but when you were doing your, your um, proof of concept for EasyMax, Samsung would have gladly provided you a handful of tablets uh, to utilize during that proof of concept. So that is certainly something to think of. It does help with the cost of doing a proof of concept. You know, there's a lot of time involved, and if you don't have to pre-buy tablets when you're not sure what software you're going to use, and then you can kind of do two things at once. You can get that um, software checked out with your customer or with your end users, and also see what they think of this particular tablet. Now, the tablet does have biometrics, so it does do the facial recognition and thumbprint, which back in 2017 was a big deal and now it's just very much the uh, standard, um, but that it also has voice to text capabilities. So if we can, um, if that's integratable into your uh, mobility solution of choice, we can certainly bring that in. 
Now, I know I've gone really quick and actually have used less time than uh, allocated. I, I wanted to make sure I didn't go over. Um, but, you know, if you, if you have any questions, uh, you can reach out to your implementation partner or you can email me directly. Uh, certainly glad to share. I can put you in touch with the Samsung rep who supports your account. Um, we can talk to the business to business team. Um, uh, Abe's out in California is a wonderful guy to work with. Uh, so, <clears throat> you know, it's certainly something to look at if you haven't made that hardware decision or if you're looking for a hardware refresh. Um, that's another thing to, to point out. The Samsung versions run every three years for their business devices. So unlike the consumer ones where everybody's scrambling to buy the latest and greatest every year, um, these do have a three-year lifespan. So Tab Active 2 was brought out in 2017. They're bringing out the Tab Active 3 as I speak. So um, the, the great news is, is if I bought a bunch of accessories for the Tab Active 2, those are compatible or will be compatible with the Tab Active 3. Um, they do, again, they're very conscious about the expenditure that's required in order to outfit your field workers uh, with these devices. So they want to make sure that when you make your investment, you're not essentially burning money in the backyard. Uh, so uh, it's, it's a great relationship. I've been really excited. They've been very generous at getting our CTP's devices. Um, so uh, any business partners that are out there. Um, I have actually um, introduced them to Interlock, so they do have a, a relationship with Interlock and Informer. Um, they were starting discussions with Data Splice before their acquisition, um, and I think that they have some conversations with EasyMax Mobile. Um, I'd have to confirm that, so I don't know that one for sure. So, um, so Anna, we have a bunch of questions. Is that all right? Okay, we, let's go. Yeah, let's uh, do questions. All right, so let me ask you the first one. Is there the ability to have a class one, division one Samsung device? Uh, zone one? Yeah, it says. So, it's a yes, that's available through ecom. So, okay. basically, what they do is they re and they, they take the core product of the Samsung Tab Active 2 or Tab Active 3, the Pro Cover, um, and they reconfigure that to be div, um, zone one, div one, zone two, div two um, compliant. Great. Do any of the devices work at a temperature range from plus, plus 130 to minus 30 degrees? Yes, they do. In fact, we have some tablets that we just sent down. Um, actually, it was mid this year. It was delayed because of COVID, um, but we sent a bunch of tablets down to Antarctica. Um, okay. Both the UK and the US have um, surveys down there, and we've sent them to those teams to check them out. All right, how about a ruggedized use or bounce test? Um, yeah, three meter, although uh, admittedly, I have thrown one uh, more than three meters. <laughs> and it, it, after three years, is still ticking. So uh, it, they are fairly rugged. I haven't tried running one over with a car and wouldn't recommend that, but they definitely handle that drop. Can you confirm that the hardware is software agnostic, meaning it doesn't really matter what software you're using, whether you're using Maximo Mobile or anywhere, or Easy Max, Data Splice? Correct. Correct. That's, okay. And and we've actually incurred because <laughs> much to some to, to some of my offering management team um, uh, dismay. I like I said, we've had them talk to Informer. We've had them talk to. Um, uh, data splice, but the object is, is we need our field workers to be mobile. And if this is something that will help enable that, I, I can't really be, <laughs> I can't say anywhere only. <laughs> That's just not right. Right, right. And are the devices Android only? No, these are, yes, I'm sorry. Yes, they are Android only. Uh, so if you're married to the iOS, that will be a problem. <laughs> All right, awesome. So Anna, thank you so much. What a great presentation that was. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank so now you. everybody keep asking those questions to Anna in chat and any ones that I may have missed, please make sure you catch those. Um, but again, I just wanna make sure that we have enough time and continue with our great agenda here. And now next we have Bart. Bart is gonna talk about Cobb County water. You can see him over there. He's got a spaceship behind him. <laughs> yes. Awesome. Thank you. Here. The right one anyway. Good. 
I should be able to see my, yeah, I think it's sharing the right one finally. Yep, looks great. Good morning, great. everybody. My name is uh, Bart Hewitt. I am the Maximo Administrator for Cobb Water. I am the only one that handles Maximo for Cobb at the moment, but I'm trying to change that. Um, let's see here. Cobb County is located in Marietta, Georgia, just northwest of uh, the greater Atlanta area. I'll admit I uh, had to grab this map real quick because Jennifer made me feel inadequate at first. Uh, Cobb County Water System uh, purchases drinking water from Cobb Marietta. Uh, Cobb County Marietta Water Authority distributes to over 190,000 homes and businesses in unincorporated Cobb County and cities of Atworth and Kennesaw. Uh, um, Bart, can I yeah. interrupt you a minute? Some sure. people are saying they're having difficulty hearing you. Would you be able to? Hmm. Let me double check my audio here, sorry. Yeah, just one second while we get that squared away. Thank you, everyone. We can hear you, it's just a little quiet. It helps if it's using the right microphone. Is that better? Much better. Okay, sorry, yeah, I was using, I have too many microphones apparently. Um, <laughs> Thank you. So uh, I'll start over on this slide. Uh, uh, Cobb County Water System purchases drinking water from Cobb County Marietta Water Authority and distributes it to 190,000 homes and businesses in unincorporated Cobb County and in cities of Ackworth and Kennesaw. Cobb Water uh, maintains more than 290,000 miles of water main ranging in size from six inches to 14 inches in diameter. Uh, we operate and maintain approximately 250,000 uh, 2,500 miles of sanitary sewer lines and 38 pump stations. We operate and maintain four water reclamation facilities that have a combined capacity to treat up to 128 million gallons of wastewater a day. Uh, just a quick ver uh, view of our asset management timeline. In 2008, um, Maximo version six was adopted by Cobb Water as a replacement for, a, for, the, for Hansen, which we were using before. Uh, Cyclo was adopted at the same time as their field uh, mobile interface tool for the system maintenance group who go out and deal with all the uh, water leaks and such out in the middle of everywhere. Um, in 2012, uh, Cow County Water updated to 7.1 of Maximo and Cyclo to version 6. April 2012, Cyclo was acquired by SAP. And we did a technical upgrade in 2013 for Maximo to go to version 7.3. And 14, we updated to version 7.5. Uh, they announced the removal of Cyclo support in 2015 from, uh, uh, for Maximo. And they basically ended maintenance for Cyclo, uh, effectively killing the application uh, shortly after that. So we had to go find a new solution. Uh, we upgraded to uh, we went live in 2018 on August 3rd to Maximo 7609 and data flight 528. Um, requirements we were looking for for mobile solution uh, it had to be usable on desktops, laptops, and mobile devices. It had to work on Windows, iOS, or Android operating systems. Uh, and this was 2017 where we we're talking about all this. Uh, we have standardized since on the Windows 10 for mobile platforms. Uh, that was an IS decision. Uh, it had to be configured with the current Cyclo workflow. We had custom, we had Cyclo configured so that we had a a, a step by step workflow for the field personnel, so that they didn't have uh, any issues. As Jennifer had mentioned, not all of you know they're they're out there doing with their job and not as they not necessarily um, the most uh, technically savvy as far as uh, dealing with computer systems and. Uh, fortunately, the Cyclo was working great for them, so we had to find something that would work with them in the future. We wanted to make sure our licensing was handed per user and not per device, uh, because previously that was what was happening. We had a lot of problems with that. Uh, we wanted to make sure we had online and offline functionality. We wanted the ability to do asset geolocation and mapping. Uh, we do not currently leverage that. Inventory management functionality and post-production sustainment and support. So we wanted to make sure that we'd be able to upgrade it as we wanted to in the future. Uh, we wanted to make sure that it was also agnostic in case maybe we left Maximo for some reason in the, new, in the future, we didn't have to worry about necessarily switching over our mobile solution. Um, and they at the time had uh, said that they work with just about anything. 
And here's our comparisons that we use. We tested out Mobile Informer from Interlock, EasyMax Mobile from Interpro, and Mobile Enterprise from, from Maximo for data splice. So that was pre-acquisition of Prometheus. And the chart pretty much speaks for itself what we were looking for. We wanted to make sure that we had pretty much green and yeses all the way across. Um, currently, local support has changed with the acquisition from Prometheus, but we haven't had any problems uh, interacting with them uh, without somebody directly uh, in Georgia. So after we vetted all the solutions, we were satisfied uh, with all the project criteria with, with data splice. Uh, it worked on all the mobile systems and operating systems that we wanted to utilize. Uh, and it's supposed to be version agnostic with concern of Maxima, which we haven't had any problems with, although we are going to uh, be moving up to version six later, which I touch on. Um, we use it for system maintenance um, currently, uh, for work order assignment and processing, uh, child ticket creation, inventory accountability and usage. Uh, for water protection, um, we're currently in progress of creating it for inventory control in our warehouses there. Um, we're targeted to go live. We're currently waiting for UAT uh, to go live uh, by the end of this year. Uh, we'd like to be able to have the operations personnel at the plants work on, uh, utilize uh, that for their inspections and tracking of their rounds. Uh, maintenance work orders uh, at the plants also, we'd like them to be able to just be able to put in their work and such there. All right, so what I'm going to do is switch over here. I actually have a live uh, demo I set up for. See, hopefully that shows, although there's something, there's a window in my way. There it goes. So this is our test environment. And this is going to be an example of our customized uh, interface. And I have a backup in case it doesn't work. Oh, good, it works. All right, so here we have uh, our, the person knows who logged in. We are allowed to select a work group. Uh, usually the person knows exactly who they're going to be, but if they're on a uh, standby, then they can select that if they're working after hours. I have a assume zone two. You're allowed to add your work team. So and uh, default storeroom, they pull from their vehicles as storerooms uh, and what vehicles you're using. And what this does is allow them to preset their team for the day uh, for that when they go out. So they don't have to worry about tracking individual time or vehicle entry at that time. Uh, and you'll see more about that here. So I'm going to go ahead and transmit and it's going to go get the stuff and update anything I have and hopefully grab the work orders that I should have. Now, mind you, this is our test environment. It does not have the same resources that our uh, production does. So the querying for the data does produce, it does go a lot faster uh, on our actual production system. Now, just to say what we do work on uh, is we primarily in an offline manner. We wanted to make sure that uh, if they're in a dead spot or any uh, place where they don't get a uh, cell signal because they usually use a hotspot for connection, that it didn't matter. Uh, and it's also the way that they were used to working with the Cyclo system prior. So here you can see I have uh, two work orders, a possible leak at a main and a sewer backup. Uh, this is how it's presented for all our personnel. If it's assigned to them, it goes by whoever is assigned as the lead. Each crew has a crew leader, a crew chief, and they're the ones that are interfacing with the actual software. Um, we're standardized on mostly tough books, uh, Panasonic tough books, but we're also using uh, integrating the newer Dell uh, ruggedized uh, laptops currently. So here I'm going to go in. And I'm going to look at it and say, okay, I want to, I'm, I'm here. I'm looking where I'm going. This is the address I'm supposed to be. Uh, we don't currently have the uh, geolocation built into it. It does have the capability, um, but we had some other things we had to work on prior to getting into there. So I'm going to start this work order. I'm on site. So I start the work order. The start time, generally you don't change this unless you forget to start your work order prior to 
getting out and doing the work. So let's say I'm excited. I want to make sure I take care of that water leak. And I realize 10 minutes later or 30 minutes later that, hey, I forgot to put my time in, right? I need to start this. So I could go backwards in time and say, hey, I'm starting this 30 minutes later. Um, I'm not going to do that for this purpose, but that's what we could do. Now, let's say that we have double checking our labor. Let's say Mr. Thorpe here has decided that he has uh, a stomach virus and has to go home uh, and somebody else shows up. I can change who is in this particular list by choosing here and then confirm. Vehicles, if uh, the other person shows up in a vehicle, we wanna make sure we're tracking the hours on that vehicle. We could add or subtract here. And now you see that we are now in in progress status. So at this point they go through and they go work on the, uh, on the issue when they're ready, if they needed to stop for some reason, they could put it in a hold uh, and that'll pause it for them, sort of like an in progress, but hold is one of our statuses for that. Uh, if they decided uh, prior to that, that they were got pulled off and needed to send it to somebody else, they can transfer it to another lead. Um, but what we're gonna do is go ahead and complete. Now all this is offline currently, so Maximo doesn't see any of these changes currently. So we're gonna go into the complete. And here we automatically prompts for a work log um, manhole spilling gray water. Of course, they're a lot more verbose. And here it's going to talk, we go in here, is this a sewer overflow? Now, if I select this, we actually have a series of escalations that go through. So I'm going to say, okay, yes, we have a problem here. Manhole number is, I'm just going to put that in. We can put in the basin. Um, small creek, which it didn't type all the way in. Great. Oh, it's got a select. Oh, basin one. Got it. Sorry. Time notified. Now, this is how our spill calculations are checked. So the time notified would be, sorry, I want now. You can tell I don't use this every day. Uh, time notified was here. I'd probably actually want to go back in time a little bit and say it was 10 o'clock that came into dispatch. And I can say arrival time was 11, time corrected, make it 11.05, line ownership is going to usually be us, but sometimes it's a private, so we have those two. Did it enter a waterway? These are checked depending on whether all these conditions are here. And so I'm not going to check that one because sometimes it sends off escalations. Fortunately, this is in test, so it wouldn't. Uh, overflow causes. Uh, uh, usually grease is a lot of the problems. And then we put in the corrective action. Uh, was the flow consistent? Field observations. And now we can put in pipe size. We'll say it was a 10 inch. Normal depth of flow of the pipe, we'll say it was four. So it automatically calculates our loss. Uh, is the lid on? So if the lid's on, we say it's 10% of what the actual value is. And I'm gonna say I'm done here. We go to next. So our failure codes, we go into uh, SS manhole, cause code. We said it was grease, remedy code. We have a jet machine on our system, so we cleared it. Here's a materials pop up. If we wanted to actually add materials to something, we would go in and add a line and we would want to go and uh, find an item. I believe if I just go to enter, it shows us all our items here and here we can go in and say, okay, what do I have on the truck? Apparently this truck doesn't have a whole lot of stuff on it. Uh, let's see, we're going to go with this one. All right. Yeah, there's that many. So we're going to say we grab one of those, hit okay. And now let's put that in there, go to next. Now here is our start time and all our people on here. At this point, if I had somebody come in halfway through the project, I could add them. Here's our vehicles. Again, if I had another vehicle come in because I needed them, I would add them and set their time for arrival. Here's where we would do follow-up uh, uh, follow up work orders as children to this particular one. So if we had other things like we need a curb cut or a driveway cut or road cut, we could click these and these automatically create new child work orders that go to the supervisor for assignment. Here it goes into the done status. And here I would transmit to make sure it gets sent back to the system.
Now, at this point, it's actually writing to Maximo, and anything that's already set up for the Maximo rules is going uh, is occurring. Uh, so it will generate a, an email that I'll probably get from the test server saying, hey, we had an overflow, and it produces an email with uh, different uh, uh, line information depending on what columns we've told it to grab data from. Now, also, when we synchronize, it, also, it will, of course, grab any information that's changed on the server. And now I go back to my um, main, and this shows that it's done. And if I refresh the screen, it will disappear. And that's basically how our guys work in the field. Get back to my... It was on my backup in case that didn't work. So we currently have an inventory project that we're working on that I mentioned earlier. Uh, we want to be able to have the, uh, the warehouse personnel at the plants uh, keep track of what they're issuing, what they're bringing in. Uh, so receiving cycle counts, issues and returns. Um, not all the warehouses at uh, spaces have Wi-Fi access, so we need uh, the the the, the pre-planning for having an offline functional system uh, is working out for us here. So it untethers the warehouse technician from their desk so they can actually go out. They have a laptop on a cart and they can actually scan uh, with barcode scanners and such. Um, and it's able allowed us to customize the workflow flow for their needs because they're warehouse technicians. They're not IT personnel. We want to make sure that their system functions for them. And that's what I got. I think I got three minutes. <laughs> that was awesome. Thank you so much, Bart. That was really good. Hey, I, I think we have a couple of questions. Um, so there's a question here from Andrew. He's saying, does it enforce Maximo rules when you are doing stuff or when you transmit? What happens? Absolutely. Okay. And then um, there's a follow on question. What happens if what you transmitted is in conflict with a Maximo rule? Uh, it errors it and doesn't enter it. To Maximo, it says there's a conflict and allows you to go back and uh, correct the issue. And then you can retransmit after the issue is corrected. Sometimes I'll admit some of the error codes are slightly cryptic, but we really don't get a lot of them. Uh, we, they were more like the first six months of us working with this that we had some of that issue. And now it, I rarely have the field personnel come to me unless they're having actual connectivity issues. And that has to do with hardware more than it does anything with the software. It's been extremely stable. Great. And there's another question, Bart. Uh, what data do you have communicating back and forth to Maximo? Uh, that's a pretty big question. Um, <laughs> it's basically uh, everything that you would deal with in a work order tracking situation. So if you're in Maximo looking at a work order and work order tracking, it's in it's it's 80 percent of that data. Now, we do have certain rules that uh, only that restrict what the system maintenance people would see versus somebody in um, stormwater or something like that because they're using different aspects of it, but it's not too, uh, too refined in that matter. But yeah, it's, it's, it's all the work order data and uh, material usage and um, uh, time tracking. Great. Um, a couple more. I'll, yeah. I'll ask a couple more and then we'll hold the rest for the, the round table. Um, can you attach pictures to your work order? Uh, technically, you can. We do not do that with Maximo currently. That is something I'd like to remedy. Um, I was not the initiator of our Maximo system, so I have a lot of stuff that they thought was the, what they wanted to do prior that I am currently pushing through to make it a little bit more user-friendly and more uh, functional. Uh, we also have a different system for storing data for the county. So there's a little bit of, of conflict of, hey, I want to store it here, but they want to store it in another place. So that's a little bit of a challenge that uh, we've had other, other things that were more important than getting pictures. So we don't actually store any kind of photo information at all. Okay, great. So there's a, again, there's a lot of great questions here. We're going to hold on to those questions um, and then we're going to come back to all of these questions and more during the round table. Okay. Great. All right, thank you again, Bart. Great, great presentation. So I'd like to share my screen here a minute.
and uh, bring up our presentation and show you where we are in the agenda. So we've made a slight change because again, this is your conference and we wanna make sure that you are getting the information you need. So what we're gonna do now is quickly go through uh, a brief discussion with Amy from Starboard and Russ from Cohesive. Um, so I'd like to turn it over to them and Amy, if you wanna start by introducing yourself. Thanks, Pam. Hey, everyone. So I'm Amy Tatum. I'm with Starboard Consulting, uh, Vice President and Technical Director. I've been working with Maximo for over 20 years now, and in that time frame, have deployed a, a wide array of user uh, needs and requirements on various mobile platforms, uh, going back to the days of, of Cyclo and um, some other products along the lines. So uh, I think our session with Russ was just going to be a little bit of a open conversation about some of our stories and lessons learned and um, things that we've seen along the way as implementers. But as, as Pam said, I think we're going to cut that part short and uh, bring our other speakers back in because there's been such a great set of questions that have been coming up in the chat. We want to go with that as well. So Russ, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks, Amy. Uh, similar to Amy's background, uh, we're you know we do a lot of Maximo implementation, so we work with a lot of companies across multiple industries. Me personally, I uh, was part of a mobile startup uh, software company here in the Atlanta area a number of years ago, and have always just had a uh, a fascination, I guess, almost with uh, with mobility, and it's really been kind of fun to watch this part of the industry mature. We've, we've all sort of grown up with it and there've been a lot of pains along the way. And as Amy said, because of our the breadth of, of what both Amy and I do with multiple clients, we, we do have, I think, maybe some interesting lessons learned to share. And, and frankly, a lot of those come from watching some failures, right? Um, and, and I think that's the whole point. It's how do you avoid the failures and focus on the successes. Um, so anyway, Amy and I have a little bit of information we could share just from our perspective on that, but consistent with what Pam said, we, we really want to make sure this time's for you. So we're going to, we're going to flip this a little bit. We'll, we'll talk a little bit here, but we'll go to the round table as quick as we can to make sure we get, there were some really good questions, Jennifer, from your session that we didn't get to. So we'll get to those. And if we have any time at the end, we can come back to Amy and I for a little bit more as well. I think we were going to kick this off. Um, Pam, with a, we've got a survey capability, correct? Correct. Yeah. We were going to ask if we have our first survey question, if we could put that into the chat, Alex, and then people could respond to that. You should all see a yes. survey question. Yep. There you go. You should be seeing it. Yeah, it looks like people are responding. You know, the, the interesting thing about this question, I think, is Obviously, everybody you've heard from here this morning has a disconnected sort of scenario, right? Where, where it's a field-driven type scenario. Um, but what we see quite often, and again, it depends on the, on the industry, right? And on the job role. But we see frequently people sometimes jumping to the conclusion that they need a disconnected solution when in reality, you know, as soon as you start talking about a disconnected mobile solution, you're talking about a lot of incremental cost and effort, right? And not just up front, but over the lifespan of that mobile solution. So let's see here, by the way, so the surveys come back here, Pam, it looks like. A little over 30. two to one with the, the disconnected. Um, yeah. And I think an, another factor in that disconnected would be when you implemented, because, you know, three, five, 10 years ago, you had to go disconnected because the, a lot of the support with the wireless networks and stuff wasn't what it is now. Um, nowadays, that's, that's a more option, a better option to, to be connected. And um, we've had a couple clients, even utilities that have done a pilot program and through that pilot discovered that while they thought they had to have a disconnected solution as they sent their guys out to, to pilot the program and ride around town and check out things, they discovered that they didn't really um, need that. And, and you're right, Russ, that's a, it can be a big difference in cost um, to go from, from one to the other. It really can. And if, you know, if the use case scenario is, 
uh, you know, let's say a generation plant in a utility or a manufacturer with that might have multiple plants, what have you, um, you know, we, you, you should look at the cost to fix the Wi-Fi, right? What is the cost to fill the gap that's creating the need for disconnected? Because oftentimes that cost may be lower than the cost of implementing a disconnected mobile solution. So that would be one of the most fundamental points, I think, that uh, that Amy and I might make in this section anyway, is make sure you need a disconnected mobile solution. You know, Jennifer um, mentioned in her, and she might want to expand on this in the round table, but she mentioned looking at some VPN tunnel um, technologies and solutions. And that's, that's kind of the idea, right? Is if you can uh, tie in. Now in Florida, you know, a number of the water utilities over the years have done that because, you know, for those of you who aren't really familiar with Florida, there's not a lot of mountains there, right? So <laughs> your, your options for cellular coverage tend to be better than, let's say, Asheville, North Carolina or something, you know. But so it, it, these things are all very client specific based on your geo and your use cases. But that would be the point we'd make on this one is make sure you've evaluated what is the cost to fill the gap. Um, if you if you need a you feel like you need a disconnected solution. Excellent, thanks, Russ. Do you guys want to ask another poll question, or do you want to go to the round table? Uh, maybe just the second one, Pam. It looks like because Amy brought it up, um, it's the pilot because yeah. I think that's so important. Um, right. There we go. So everybody can see that pilot question. Wow, looking like similar results, huh? Yeah, yeah. yeah numbers are trending very much the same direction. Yeah, exactly. So. But I, yeah, I think with mobility, this is sort of more important than ever. And you heard Anna mention it in the hardware session. I think Jennifer alluded to it as well. And, the, and really the same thing with BART, right? It's good. Because when you're dealing with mobile, you're dealing with a significant um, people change management scenario, especially if you're implementing mobile for the first time, right? And it's that people change management thing, right, that you got to think about. And that's both at the hardware layer, because although this is a lot better now than to your earlier point, Amy, you know, three to five, seven years ago, not as many people were using mobile devices in their personal lives. Now they are, Everybody and but, is, yeah. but just piloting the interaction with the mobile device can be important. And from a people change management standpoint, we always try to encourage companies to get some of their key end users involved in the actual hardware selection, mm -hmm. right? Now you may, you may standardize on a, on a mobile OS uh, as a company, but get them involved in a pilot is a great way to do that. In addition to Amy, I'll let you talk about maybe some other considerations of a pilot as well. I think one of the things I've seen come out of the pilots um, as well as, is the need for training. And, and even with people who have personal devices now, if, if you've got a personal device that's an Android and then you deploy an iOS solution, just even interacting with the device itself is a lot different. And, and I know we've, had folks that scheduled training programs around using the applications and then found out that really the training needed to be just how do you interact with an Apple device. Um, so pilots are, are good at revealing not only the, the business case and some of the user scenarios, but even just some of those simpler things that you might take for granted, um, particularly coming from an IT perspective, you just expect everybody knows how to use um, the device or, or something like that. And, and they're not always as intuitive as, I don't know, seems like four-year-olds pick them up way easier than 40-year-olds do. So, <laughs> yeah, You know, you the know. other the other thing with a pilot, I think with mobile, even more than implementing Maximo, it, your, your risk of scope creep is oh, tremendous, yeah. right? So with a pilot, you can really solidify the scope, right? Because what happens inevitably, and I'm sure Bart and Jennifer could speak to this, these examples, I'm sure you experienced it, but as soon as you put that device with a mobile solution into uh, an end user's hand, 
they're gonna naturally start thinking about other things they wanna do, right? That they didn't think about if you had a requirements definition session <laughs> a few months earlier or whatever. So the pilot can be really important to solidify your scope as well. Yeah. Absolutely. So we've talked about a couple of things that Jennifer and Bart might wanna comment on. So why don't we go ahead and bring our other speakers back in and, um, and start the round table portion of this and try to catch back up on some of the questions that maybe got missed earlier, as well as just uh, keep this conversation going about some of the, the pilot and connectivity. And uh, I know we had some thoughts around maps and what might be happening there, et cetera. Pam, remind me, can people in the round table, do they have a way to raise their hand if they wanna verbally speak or is there, are they just limited to the chat? You should be able to take yourself off mute, raise your hand. Um, I think if we all take ourselves off mute at one time, it might be a little bit of a problem, but, uh, <laughs> um, but this is definitely the time. We do want you to have that opportunity to just ask a question instead of having to type it. Um, so we've got over a half hour here. And again, this is your conference. This is such a great opportunity to hear from all these people on the phone or on our virtual conference here. Um, so if anybody wanted to get that started, um, and while we're waiting for that, how about I ask the first question here to Bart. Uh, Bart, do you have any issues with multiple texts trying to sync offline data at the same time, say at the end of a shift with bandwidth or anything like that? Uh, we have not experienced any issue with that at all. The, the pro biggest problem I have is getting them to log off at the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to expand on that anymore, Bart? Like what happens if they don't log off? Uh, often they'll just close up their, they'll put their uh, device to sleep without logging out. They'll open up the next day. They may forget to transmit in the morning or they'll transmit and the data is conflicting uh, because they've decided to open it up in a second browser. There's, there was, these were several things we had in the first six months of our uh, project that um, were identified. And I really, we really don't have that problem. I haven't had to go in and kick anybody out in months. And I mean, mostly probably 10 months, to be honest. So that was a beginning issue more than it is a current issue. Excellent. Anyone want to ask that first live question? Actually, um, Pam, I wrote down a few of the questions that were in the chat from when I had my presentation. That's me great. Go over those? Yeah, that'd be perfect. Okay, so someone asked if I'm currently using maps um, in my current solution. So in our current online solution of Maximo 761, we do have spatial 76 implemented. So we can see all of our work orders and our assets on the map in the Maximo tabs now in the core Maximo, or if they do remote in, um, I don't think we have many that do, but they could see it if they still, that remote connection is still active um, that we implemented originally with the product. Um, we put Maximo in. And someone else asked with Easy Max Mobile, what were the main factors that led us to, to proceed with Easy Max Mobile? And I say the main factors were the ease of configuration um, of the IT person being able to configure that product and the easeability of that, along with that it could work with multiple devices and that there was no auto scrolling and just the ease of use for the mechanics. It just overall seemed the best product to meet all of our needs and be the easiest to update and configure and um, implement out to the users. Someone asked about the EHS and lockout tagout, how we do those. Um, we're not currently doing those within our Maximo, but I know when we were configuring the original screens for our mode, those are some of the things that are available on the left side under actions. So you could just click on those and then they would go to display lockout tagging information or safety information um, to the technician using the product. And they asked how many users we had. We have um, purchased 60 licenses, I believe. We usually have about 20 to 25 mechanical uh, techs, 20 to 25 operators that also use the system to do their work orders. And then we have about 10 for managers and support personnel. So we're at about 60 licenses. In our trial group, we had eight people in our trial group. Um, four of them were techs, a couple of them were managers, and then the support personnel. And then someone asked about how do they get their work orders? How do the, the mechanics um, know which ones they're supposed to work on? 
And so that um, first screen that I went to on Easy Max is displaying the same Start Center that they have in Core Maximo. And on that, we had already configured uh, queries that came to result sets that displayed the work orders that were assigned to them. So we are using assignments through Maximo, um, in the assignment feature where it actually assigns them the work. And then through those assignments, we can do queries and pull them to result sets on the Start Centers. And then that uh, flows directly through to Easy Max. Um, I think that was all the questions that I had during my area. Excellent. A few more have come into the chat. Um, and again, raise your hand if you have a question that you'd like to ask verbally. Um, this one is for both Bart and Jennifer. Can you tell us what mobile device management tools or systems you're using? Um, I have heard our IT department talking about a product called Sophos, I believe. And I'm not sure if that's what you're asking about. Um, again, I'm in the O&M group reliability group, not in the IT, but I think they're talking about using Sophos to manage mobile devices to control what things are put on them and try and make them more secure. Um, and we have not implemented that yet. That was part of our, our uh, roadblock to getting any mobile solution correct was trying to get something on the mobile devices that would make them more secure connecting into the network. So they wanna be implementing Sophos or something like that along with their VPN tunnel, which like I said, we're looking at NetMotion and um, Zscaler right now to try and decide. So Steve yeah. said, yes, that's correct. Cobb County uses NetMotion for that process for the VPN connection. Um, and that they have a global system for handling how um, how how the actual security is handled outside of that, which I am not privy to. But I do know that Net Motion is how they handle the VPN connection to get out from the outside world and into our intranet. Excellent. Uh, question for Amy. Amy, um, do you believe that work centers, Maximo work centers, are a viable alternative to mobile solutions? And is that a direction that Maximo is moving towards? Um. I think that's a little bit use case based. I think they are a viable solution for certain uh, user stories. And we've worked closely with a handful of clients to deploy those. Uh, service requests are fantastic with the work centers. Uh, the inspection pieces are really good. Some of the work management components are probably a little lacking at this point. And I know with the new Maximo Mobile that's being deployed, they're kind of pulling in some of the work center pieces along with anywhere, uh, I think to shore up some of that work management perspective, the fact that the work centers weren't configurable from a work management perspective um, really limited them because you know, we all add extra fields to our work order table and they're pieces of data that we want technicians to collect. And uh, sometimes getting that, that part in place really limited their usefulness from a work management perspective. But I do see a lot of investment from the IBM side um, in the work management or in the work centers. So I, I think that's definitely something to, to continue to monitor and um, see where they go with it. Uh, but it's not the, the cure all for things just yet would be my thoughts. Yeah, Russ, anything you wanted to add to that? Uh, I think Amy just said it all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I'd second that too. We actually looked at the work centers as well when we were starting to look at our, what are we gonna do for mobile? Um, and yeah, the lack of configurabil configurability was the biggest downfall of the work centers. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and we did, so from the field, you know, we've, we've, you know, the field sellers, as well as getting information from you guys, the customers, we have made that very clear to offering management that the work centers are pretty, but if they're not following the ma the master tenet of Maximo of configure versus custom, um, that their viability is limited. And it is my understanding that they are working to improve the configurability of work centers um, and uh, as well as to uh, propagate that into Maximo Mobile. Okay, excellent. So Anna, there were some questions on 5G. Any comments on that? 
Yeah, right now for the B2B devices, um, they're still in the 4G LTE mode. Uh, once I think 5G becomes more readily available, uh, then they'll take that. So probably I'd see that maybe in the tab active four. So uh, we're looking for that further out. Unless you're in a major city, you really don't have access to 5G yet. Uh, so they're trying to keep the line um, of ruggedized devices minimal so that they can keep the prices down. Excellent. Looks like we have a question from Doug. Doug, you want to ask your question? See that little hand up there? Yeah. Hey, thanks, Pam. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. So a uh, question I have along the lines of implementing and making the decision to implement a mobile solution. Um, a lot of times we see specific workflows that could benefit uh, but clients are really looking for that cost benefit analysis, right? Which is a lot of times hard to come by ahead of time. And so I am interested uh, uh, from Jennifer and Bart and anybody else on the line, do you have like quantitative metrics that you've gathered that kind of point to the benefit of mobile things like um, labor efficiency improvements or asset uptime or anything like that? Um, we don't have anything uh, that we have actually quantified, except that we know that right now our workforce all comes into the office about 2.30, 3 in the afternoon, and they all sit down at their desks and they all start doing Maximo. So the thought process is if we can keep them out in the field and let them do their work from the field, um, like I showed you, we're transversing three counties, so they're everywhere. So it could take them 45 minutes to drive back to the office where and then sit down for that half an hour, 45 minutes. And let's say it really only takes them 10 minutes. So now they're just chatting in the office for the last 30 minutes because there's nothing they can do in the field. So, I mean, we haven't actually quantified it, but we know there will be an increase in productivity of the technical workforce once they can stay in the field and do their products. The other thing we see is a, um, a small delay. We do print out some of our work orders for a certain subset of our uh, mechanics who are less tech savvy. So we still have a few getting printed work orders and then there's a time delay in getting their data back in the system because it has to go to the um, Maximo admin person who sits in, then types all their data in. So we have a delay in our reporting, which we have to give up to our board um, each month or each two months when they have their board meetings. So we're uh, like a month or two behind in our reporting and we're hoping we can close that gap once we get our mobile product in place. So, so there's a couple of, you know, tangible benefits we see, but we haven't quantified any costs to it. No. Yeah, I'd have to agree that, that we have basically the same situation. We have I produce several reports that go to different uh, over managers of different departments for water protection or system maintenance. And they do analyze, you know, how, how many work orders, how long are they working on it? What type of work order is it? Um, but uh, as far that that's about the only quantitative measures we have, but we haven't compared it to whether or not, you know, we're getting a value out of the, out of the mobile solution itself. Uh, like I said earlier, I, I came into us already having one and we had to re adopt something because we've become reliant on it when that particular product was no longer supported. Um, but I, I definitely know that th just by looking at how much less issues I'm we're ha much less interaction with the um, the users in the field coming to me for problems with this particular software that it has created more work time versus downtime with them trying to deal with stuff and coming into the uh, in, in you know into physically work on something as Jennifer mentioned you know coming in and they're, they're more talking than at the last 20 minutes of their shift and they are having to put anything in because it's already been transmitted in there um and jennifer for for you kind of a follow-on what's the feedback been from the users um are they super excited to have this new technology or are they kind of reluctant participants what's been the feedback okay so of our trial group um our area is divided into a north and south region and then within those north and south regions we have an operations and a maintenance group so we asked for at least one participant from each of those four subset groups and our mechanical subset is pretty excited about it. We have one operator um, who's not tech savvy and his biggest comment is, why do I have to put two programs on to make one work? 
you know, he doesn't get the whole VPN solution has to connect you in. And I've tried explaining this to him. Um, he's like, I shouldn't have to start two programs to make one work. <laughs> so, I'm with him, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for Cobb County, we they, that all is automated uh, in the startup process for the piece for the actual computer itself. I'm not sure what IS has done with it, but all they have to do is actually log in to the software through the web browser and they're on. They don't have to deal with net motion or any other things. The only thing they really have to bring up is their uh, the GIS web mapping since it's not currently integrated with our system. But um, we, we did have a, a lot of positive reaction to being able to cluster the work or the, the, the work group people saying, you know, instead of, they used to have to go through with Cyclo and individually put in work for each person on their crew. And now they just go through the system and make sure they've added anybody who came at a later date or left at a certain time. And it calculates it all for them. And that saves them a good 20 minutes per work order uh, for what they used to have to do. That has been our biggest positive feedback uh, for changing over. Uh, thank you both. And, and Bart, maybe on the side, you guys can come configure our login for us. <laughs> Um, I see another question here in the chat for me. It says, what was the makeup of the working group that directed the project? Um, so myself as the maintenance plan and reliability manager, I'm also the primary Maximo um, user support slash technical, technical and user uh, Maximo support. And then we had representatives from each of those four areas I was just mentioning, the um, we had Oper North, Operation South representative, Maintenance North, Maintenance South representative, both managers and a tech from each area. And then we had from the IT side, there's the manager um, in charge of all like applications. And then he's got a very technical IT person on Maximo and that person is currently a contractor for us. Um, and then there's the head O&M um, senior manager was also as part of that team and looking into the, the products and the evaluating the different products we had. So it was a combination of, yes, the o &M, the technical, the IT, you know, kind of a cross-functional team that looked and evaluated all of the different demos and um, have been involved in the discussions and picking Easy Max Mobile as the product that we would go with. Excellent. That's a, a great team, Jennifer. And I think that's probably, um, one of the more important things, whether doing a, a pilot or a wider implementation is having some representation across a wider swath of the organization because you do get you know, differences of opinion and experience. And you, know, Russ made the comment earlier about lessons learned and some of the failures or some of the best lessons. And, and I know historically that has on occasion been a point of failure if the team was too small or too limited and it's scope and focus, then you end up potentially deploying a solution that works fantastic for 25% you know, of the organization because those are the ones that were represented on the, the core team, but doesn't work for everybody else. So that's great that you were able to, to bring in such a, a wide group of folks with different uh, perspectives going into the project. Hey, Jennifer, maybe you and Bart, I just typed it in, but um... It, this starts to touch on a topic that I don't think we've talked about yet, which is support, right? So um, I'm curious, Bart, your experience and Jennifer, yours in terms of the staffing, the resourcing that you think is appropriate, that feels about right in terms of ongoing sustainment and maintenance of the mobile application. What what are your experiences? And Jennifer, that might be completely fair to you because I don't know how far into the Easy Max deployment you are, but Bart, you... You've been at that for a while. We, we see that as pretty important and something that sometimes people overlook is the reason I asked the question. Yeah, I mean, and you're speaking of uh, like on-site groups or support for from the actual uh, whoever has our maintenance. Which side are you? No, I, I mean, I mean, your yeah, your internal support. Oh, people. internal. For example, if you need to make some configuration changes for for your end user base. Yeah, <laughs> well, I, I would love to have some help <laughs> personally. Right. I mean, it, I, I, 
we are working on trying to expand to at least have one other person because right now the entirety of the knowledge base is basically in my head in my hands uh, if i got hit by a bus tomorrow there would be no one that could really easily step in and keep doing the things i'm already doing and that's been acknowledged and we're working towards correcting that um, but i really think it depends on the size of your organization first off i'm sure tampa needs a much higher uh, uh, ratio of people to deal with it. I mean, as far as uh, technical side, I have a small team uh, of IS folks, uh, database folks that are dedicated, like I'm part of their group. So they know that I'm, you know, out of five people, five groups that they have to work with, you know, I'm one of those five. Um, but I think for us, because everything's been pretty, pretty easy, and I don't have a lot of demand for change, to be honest, so we're pretty, the, the change goes slow in the county governments, I've noticed. Um, it, it's, it's been relatively easy to handle. For me, a lot of times my, my stopping point is trying to figure out what needs to be done and where it is because it's such a vast, you know, there's tables upon tables of, of information and sometimes I don't know exactly where that is because I haven't touched it in six or eight months. Um, so I think it really, but ultimately I think it depends on the size of your, your group and how many people you have asking you to change things mm -hmm. but right now it's just me <laughs> and it works okay so yeah, you you are the change bay. board then is that right pretty much <laughs> yeah gotcha at tampa bay water um myself i can handle some of the changes and then like i said i have an it support person that is a contractor right now that can handle support we have in the past gotten maximo support by um getting other uh, consultants to come and help us. Um, we haven't had an in-house Maximo person from the IT side since we implemented Maximo. Um, we do have a database person who can help periodically when we have database issues, but most of the Maximo configuration comes through me and then I get that um, to whatever support personnel we have at the time, whether it's an outside consultant or whether it's right now we have a hired inside consultant um, that works basically 40 hours a week for us in-house. Good, thank you. What's our next question, Pam? You're on mute. Yes. Sorry, I was chatting away. Um, <laughs> we, we can see your lips moving. <laughs> thanks, Amy. Um, so there is a question that was in the chat that I wanted to bring up because I think it's really important and I don't think we hit on it. The question is, how are you handling device security and OS updates? And the follow-up question, are devices locked, docked, and hardlined connected when not in use? So how uh, about, no, go ahead, Bart. Sure, yeah. Um, I, like I think I mentioned before, IS handles the security side uh, of that. And so, any any global changes have to take place while the you know they're particularly offline at a certain time. They usually send out an email to say, "Hey, leave your device on." As far as docking, since we're on laptops, most of the I, I hate I hate this part about it, but most of the most of the guys leave their their device in the truck, um, and that's not always the greatest thing, especially when you get cold weather and batteries and things like that. But that's tends to be the mentality of what's going on with that. And I don't have I don't have control over the the technology specifically, like the actual hardware. That's another group that handles it. But I do, you know, try to say, hey, don't do that. Put it in your locker at least, so it's not ice cold. But they don't uh, usually have to hard line in unless uh, there is some sort of strange change with a password that got screwed up, and it needs to touch, it needs to know it's wired in to be able to do configuration. So some things are limited depending on whether you're wireless or not. Um, usually with security passwords and things, you want to change that. You want to usually dock the say, dock it onto a hard line so that the system knows it's official, I guess, is the way to look at it. That's that's the way I've seen it working. So, so Bart, are they, does everyone have their own device or do you share devices? Uh, each crew chief has control of the, the device. Now, anybody can log in from any county computer and get into Data Splice and or Maximo. So that's, you know, it, it's really like I have one on my desk. I have a laptop. Apparently, I'm getting a, a, a tablet soon. 
Um, but most everybody at least has one or the other. The field crews are almost always going to have a laptop, and that's what they're interfacing on. Uh, and they have docking stations in their trucks, but they don't have anywhere to put it. They don't have a desk or anywhere to, to, to put them. So they're usually either stuck in a locker, which is fine, or they're left docked in the truck, which is in the yard, which is locked up and monitored. So that's how that tends to work on that. Excellent. Jennifer, anything you want to add to that? Um, our technicians just have laptops at this point, um, and those they are responsible for. I'm not sure exactly where they put them um, at the end of the day. And RIT has a product that's um, implemented on all of our laptops, and they do security updates. I believe it's every Wednesday um, to all of the laptops. And that's where I was talking about that Sophos product. They're trying to figure out something that as we implement the uh, tablets, they will have something that they can control those with. And so they haven't figured that out. And that was one of our big roadblocks to being able to use tablets out in the field was having something that they could secure those down with. Excellent. There's also a question that just came in about how do you handle large training during the pandemic that we're in? Has anyone had to work through anything like that? I had to work through a UAT for our go live of Maximo 7611. <laughs> oh my. Yes, um, we did um, three days of a UAT where I ran um, through the Teams app, um, had everyone log in. The person who was doing their section in Maximo shared their screen. We got to see what they did. And then it went to the next role and that person shared their screen and we got to see the steps that they did. And so we went through that. That was, um, that was quite a, an event. <laughs> wow. Yeah, we haven't had any opportunity to do any kind of training like that since we're sort of going with the flow of what we already have but we've had some we have our crews split between our central location and our four plants so they don't all so you don't it was a way of spreading out people so that we didn't have you know 60 guys in one room because obviously that's a bad idea during a pandemic um and we've talked about doing some doing some refresher training during what they call rainy day days where they delay uh, people going to the field due to weather conditions. And we have a very large spaced out where you can have one table per person for everybody that we have, uh, but we haven't had, we haven't had that happen yet. So I don't have any experience and hopefully by next year, summer ish, things will be a lot different when we're actually doing our 761.2 and uh, data splice 60 upgrades. So. Excellent. Again, if anybody has a question, we got a couple minutes left, please raise your hand. I have another question that came in is, do you have any plans to use the mobile devices to monitor worker safety? For example, potentially pushing out a notifications in case of severe weather? Is that of interest to anyone, Bart, Jennifer? Well, the Data Splice app mm -hmm. has the ability for us to send that out, but I don't, usually dispatch will handle that through the radio system, to be honest. Okay, okay. And we have an app that's on all of our phones called Everbridge. And our safety department uses that. And most everyone has a mobile phone. There are a few operators that don't have mobile phones, but um, they're usually in the console. And so that the notifications for safety events like um, tornado watches or heavy thunderstorms moving through the area, or we've had ones where there have been like accidents on the road getting to our, one of our main stations and they tell people about that. Um, those type of things, they send out notifications through Everbridge and it comes in both as a well, three ways, as a message on the phone through the Everbridge app, you will also get a phone call to your phone and then a voicemail if you don't answer it. And you also get an email. So they send out emergency notifications and safety notifications through that. There's also an option through that, I believe it's also through the Everbridge program where should you be in the field working um, alone and you're doing something that you wanna make sure you know people know if you have any issues, you can get notification out. You can put yourself in what's called a safety corridor and require a check-in like every 60 minutes. And if you don't go check in in those 60 minutes, then a notification is sent to your manager and to the safety people that there's somebody here in this area 
who's put themselves in a safety corridor and then they didn't check in. So they would know to go out and check on that person and find out what was going on. Um, there's Johnny Lee just put something in like a voice, a comment about training. I'm not sure what that one is. Uh, can Excuse you hear me? Oh yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Okay, listen, um, my boss was talking to me for the past five minutes, so I missed most of it, but I caught one thing about training. Uh, we have a lot of people end users who have issues about how to do certain things. And one of the things that myself and another individual that works with me are considering doing, which we hadn't started yet, but we're going into, is put a lot of um, tricks and tips on YouTube videos. And if anybody else has already started it, I, I'd like to know something about it, see how they're doing. But basically, we're thinking about YouTube only because we have three shifts and it's very hard to do we use Teams, do Teams meeting at various times and so forth. And we figured any, this would be the best way because the individuals can go look at the videos anytime they want. I just want to put that out there. Sounds like a good idea to me. <laughs> yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, and just a little plug those... for, for Maximo Assist, you could actually include those videos as part of content that you provide into a Maximo Assist. Um, which is the you know augmented intelligence uh, package within Maximo, or that's part of the Maximo application suite that allows you to query information. So you can query not only work orders, but you could also include those videos so people could do natural language querying to bring those up. Great, it looks like Jennifer has raised her hand. Another Jennifer, lots of Jennifers. I haven't raised my hand. <laughs> uh, Jennifer's iPad, his hand is raised. Not sure if she meant to do that. Okay, so now can you hear me? Yep, yep. Okay, so my question is, whenever we've done certain deployments, um, and I've done a couple with the Easy Max, we add a lot more capability. We do example, like you said, the um, treble, cause remedies, um, assignments. So you actually increase the work for some of the users. Do you find that, and how do you, how, do you, how would you address that? Because again, they are doing more, you're getting a lot more benefit, but you're really not saving that much time or has not, have you not realized that? I've not run into that yet. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't, I, I honestly don't see how three or four drop downs causes a lot of time loss either, especially for the value of the data that you're collecting uh, to know, uh, you know, in the future to be able to mine that and say, hey, we're, we're is the you know, are we having severe problems on this particular uh, length of gravity main with uh, overflow assist problems? Do we need to schedule it for more regular preventative maintenance and things like that? I, I feel that any time for recording that particular information is outweighed by the use of that information for predictive uh, maintenance. Great, thank you all so much. Well, we're almost at the the top of the hour, so I think I'm going to wind us down and. Before we start our charity drawing, again, I want to send a huge thank you to all of our presenters today. How amazing you were. Thank you so much. Um, also, just again, want to get any feedback from you. Please drop us a line anytime if you would like to continue a conference like this in the future. We're open. It seems like mobile is such a hot topic, you know, especially as we move into 2021. Starboard and Cohesive, I'm sure, would be more than willing to host another session like this next year. But now I want to actually turn it over to Karen, who is going to close us out with our charity drawing today. Okay. Karen. All right. Well, thank you, everyone who participated today. We really appreciate it. And now for the charity drawing. Um, is Helen Ellis on the call still? Helen, you still with us? Should they unmute Pam and yeah. say that yeah. they are? I'm still here. Yay! All right. hey, well, Helen. <laughs> Helen, you are the winner of the uh, one of our um, charity drawings. So um, do you have a charity in mind that you would like to announce or do you want to take some time to think about that and let us know? Uh, the ASPCA would be fine. All right. 
Nice. Fantastic. Yay. Very good. <laughs> great cause. <laughs> great yes. cause. Yeah, we, we appreciate that. So, all right. Then in, is uh, Jennifer Stoutson uh, with the town of Aurora. Are you still on, Jennifer? Yes, I am. All right. Well, congratulations. You are the other winner of our charity drawing today um, for a $100 gift card to go to the charity of your choice. Do you happen to have a, um, um, a charity in mind at this time? I do. I don't know if you do. Uh, I'm up in Canada. So if you do ALS Canada, I would. ALS Canada. Excellent. Another great, great cause. Yeah. Very good. That's Very great. good. Thank you so much. Well, I appreciate that. That was really great today. Yeah. Excellent. No, thank you. Thank you. So. Uh, with that, I think we're closing out the session. Uh, again, just a, a round of applause to all those that presented. We really enjoyed hearing the stories of your mobile journey from Jennifer, Bart, and Anna. Thank you for the uh, presentation on the hardware. Um, and then also a thank you to Amy and Russ for the um, discussion. I hope you found this valuable today. Um, we appreciate the opportunity to... Uh, to be with everyone and uh, look forward to our next one. So with that, we're closing off. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.